Business is simple. It's just not easy. We focus on three things to help you run and grow your business more easily. Talent, sales, and how to scale. This is the Talent, Sales, and Scale Show. Hey everyone, Brian Whittington with this episode of the Talent, Sales, and Scale Show. Today we have Jamie Began. Is that right, Jamie Began? That was the corrupted name. It was, it's a really, how do you pronounce it again? It's Began. Began, son of a gun. So we have Jamie Began here, and he's, he's going to talk to us about a really curious thing. So he's scaled several different companies, and he's tech-minded. So he comes out of this uh, from an engineering standpoint, and it's how in the world, and especially since so many of us founders are that engineer, super analytical, super... Um, you know, high intelligence kind of thing. How do we take this where we might not have looked at sales as wonderful? How do we go from having that mindset to really being excellent at it? And I think Jamie's done really well in that approach. Um, he comes to us from Right Brain Networks as the founder CEO there and is really doing quite a lot of, a lot of things from it. So with that said, Jamie, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So, um, you know, let's jump right into this. I mean, it, it's probably the easiest one to answer, but why in the world should we listen to you? I mean, you had this engineering background, you built up a couple of different co uh, companies and you've grown some things. I mean, why should we listen to you about that transformation from that engineering analytical background to a kind of a sales mindset? Sure. Um, well, yeah, my background is in both systems slash network engineering and software development. Uh, I've been doing this stuff for about 25 years now. And you know, when I decided to want to start right brain, like I did everything possible not to do sales. You know, I would you know, recruit my friends to try to get them to convince what we're here and become a sales guy for me. I, I just didn't want to do it at all. And, and over the past, say, 11, 12 years, you know, I've kind of had to accept the fact first that I had to do it. And then I found out I was actually pretty good at it. And then I've gotten really good at it. I mean, I've sold millions and millions of dollars worth of our services over the years and, um, you know, learned a lot of what it, sales actually is. And, and it's, it's very much different than what I originally thought it was when I was purely an engineer. Okay. Well, no. So let's talk through that because that is, I, I think, even people that get into sales, oftentimes they try to say they're anything but, right? It's the most curious thing. What was the original reason? Why didn't you want to do it? And I'll have a couple of follow-up questions off of mm -hmm. that, but why didn't you want to do it originally, Jamie? The big thing is I, I just didn't understand what sales actually was. I thought okay. it was something, I thought it was a personality trait. You, you were born with to be this, you know, charismatic, you know, like whining and dining and playing golf with kind of people. And, you know, I'm an introvert and that's just, just not how I roll. So I, I always figured that this was just a, a, a character flaw or a character difference that would prohibit me from being successful in sales. And in kind of what, as I learn more about sales, I learned that it, it's actually way more like engineering than I originally you know, understood it to be. You know, it's very process driven, very process orientation. It's about solutioning. And, and most importantly, it's about listening. And, and these are all things that like, engineers are just wired to do. And it makes them exceptionally good salespeople if they, if they just kind of accept themselves in, into that role. Yeah, and, and I'm glad that you said that. Now, if you wouldn't mind, solutioning is a little bit of a newer term for me. And I think that's fairly well known or well used in, in engineering, for, like engineering circles. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, it can be broadly used. I'm sure different people have different definitions, but I can happy to expound on what I- Yeah, would you mind hitting that. that real quick about solutioning? Right. It, it's well, first off, it's about like listening to the customer, really understanding what problems they're trying to solve for. In, in many cases, the customer doesn't even really understand what their problem is. And once you really, really understand what they're trying to solve for from a business level, then, then solutioning is just kind of understanding how your skills and experience and products or, or whatever you have might map to those needs. And, you know, sometimes it's, they're just not a fit. And, you know, sales is not about trying to convince people to buy from you. It, it's about finding out if there's a match. It, it's not a whole lot different than dating. You, know, you really can't force that to happen. You, you just have to make sure you understand 
what their needs are, what their problems are, and, and also intimately understand what value your solution provides and just see if there's a match. And, and I think that that's a, a key thing to be successful as an engineer in sales. Yeah, and so that's pretty interesting, Jamie, right? So solutioning what you what you talked about. So let's put it into, you know, if you go in through sales training, you're going to hear that listening to customers. They're going to call it active listening. And that's one of the key traits, key characteristics that is honestly missing. And whenever you're looking at a lot of salespeople, they're too busy talking as opposed to listening. So that active listening is critical. And then uncovering problems too often, and, and I would even say this, and you can push back on this, Jamie, I'd say this, even people that are engineer types, they'd rather do features and benefits and to tell you all about my product rather than starting to uncover problems. So did you discover that this was the way or did you start off like that as an engineering, as an engineer kind of being curious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, be curious is actually one of our core values at Right Brain. I mean, it's central to everything that we do. And in order to be curious, you have to listen first and foremost. And, you know, I think a good number of, you know, engineers are introverts, you know, certainly not all of them. But, but I think listening kind of is easier for introverts to do than, than extroverts. So that, that's kind of my default state is to observe people and, you know, work through solutions in my mind and listen to them and, and connect dissimilar pieces together to try to come up with a solution. I mean, the process, mental process, isn't a whole lot different than when I'm writing software or, or designing a network. You know, it, it's just I'm doing it in my head, you know, with, uh, with other people kind of trying to solve a problem for that. So let unpack that a little bit, because I know we had originally spoken whenever we got introduced, we had originally spoken about maybe doing the alignment of design thinking to sales. So talk to me a little bit about what's that process, because you probably do it just intuitively. You don't even realize that you're doing it. So can you put any process to what you're doing in your mind to try to unpack or uncover that problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, kind of calling back to what you'd said uh, last question is, you know, why don't more sales folks actually do this kind of stuff? And I think a big part of it is that I don't think some salespeople really, really understand their product or, or their service, or even more importantly, they don't understand that their customer and what, the, what their customer's problems are. So it's really hard to kind of, you know, thread that needle and, and connect these different things together if you don't have a true understanding. Um, you know, my first process, you know, when I get on a phone call with somebody, like one of the first things I'll ask, you know, so, you know, how'd you hear about this? And that kind of lends me a little bit of kind of uh, insight into is what problem that they're trying to solve, just based upon how they actually found us. I mean, if they came in through the website or they came in from a referral, I'll kind of scratch in that a little bit. And, you know, and then one of the things that, you know, shortly thereafter, is I've kind of, you know, asked for what the, what the compelling event was, you know, you know, why did you choose to reach out to us now, not last week or next month? there's something right then and there that caused them to actually reach out. So then I'll kind of dig into that a little bit and kind of understand a little bit more of what's topical top of mind for them. And then I'll actually just start to ask questions about their business. You know, how long have you been in business? Um, you know, what, you know, tell me about your customers and, you know, another important aspect I have to understand is kind of how, how that business makes money, how the customer makes money and to by extension, maybe even how their customers make money. Um, because, you know, my customer is only going to hire me for one of two reasons. I'm either going to save them money or I'm going to make them money. Right. And I've got to find a way to actually kind of, uh, kind of skate my, that conversation into one of those avenues to kind of figure out what that, that eventual solution would be. So that's how we kind of lead off the conversation and then kind of let just kind of grow from there. All right. So I like that. So one, it's the, get their well or get their why. What's the emotional and compelling reason why they're going to they're going to reach out? So you're doing that through, hey, why'd you reach out to us, or how'd you find us? How'd you stumble up across us? And that's going to give you a lot of insights there. And then two, what was a compelling event? So back in, like, if you Google Sandler Pain Funnel, you can follow along on this. But really, one of the key key tenants there is, you know, how long has this been an issue? Because that gets to your what was the compelling event? Because if it's been a problem for 10 years, something massive had to have changed for them to call you now. If they're brand new into this industry or brand new at having this problem, 
then they're likely just trying to, they're on a fishing expedition, expedition to try to find, you know, what's really going on and understand, and that might not be the, the client for you. So that, what is the compelling event to reach mm -hmm. out to you is huge. And my sense is what you're doing off of this then, Jamie, is that you're taking all of this information to contextualize, right? To find out what's the context of this conversation so I can find relevance of how am I going to save you time, eliminate risk, or, you know, um, save you money kind of thing or make you money. So is, is that all a, a good understanding of what you're doing with those couple of questions? Yeah, it's basically setting the frame framework in which I'm going to continue to navigate the conversation. And, you know, I think another thing that I think it's worthwhile for like uh, engineers, you know, becoming sales guys, is understanding that you're not going to like win every deal and, and really you shouldn't win every deal. You know, I'm spending a lot of time at the beginning qualifying these people. You know, I'm, a, you know, I call it disqualifying. I'm looking for ways to, in which I can't help them. And, you know, maybe it's just not good chemistry. You know, maybe, maybe their, their service offering or my service offering doesn't map to what they need to do. And I'm not looking to force it. I'm, yeah, I, I think this is a huge mindset for engineers is that they feel like they're on, they've got to like close this deal because this, this is kind of what their mission is. You know, my mission is to solve problems. And yeah, I, I, my, my cash run or my business runs on cash. I need to make money doing this. This isn't a charity, but I kind of just kind of just kind of set that aside right now. And I first understand what, what the problem is and then really try to figure out whether I can actually solve that problem. And I'm not actually hard selling anything. You know, if, if in, in the course of our conversation, I find ways that I can actually help them, then kind of it just kind of naturally comes up that, you know, hey, maybe we should find a way to actually, you know, take the next step. Yeah. So two things come off of that. And the curious thing is it's not engineers who try to do this. Salespeople try to do this too. And mm -hmm. if you are a sales leader, so let me ask you, ask you this and I'll go into those two pieces. Do you have a sales team, Jamie, or are you the, you the, the sole provider of sales? So I've got, uh, I'm like, I consider myself a full-time seller. Uh, I've got one guy who's kind of half BDR, half uh, account manager at this point, And he's kind of in flux. I'm trying to get him to kind of, uh, kind of advance his career a little bit. And then I also recently retained the services of an outside uh, BDR firm. So that's uh, too soon to tell, but, uh, you know, their job is to actually kind of help us hunt and, and then I'll probably be the one on there closing. Got it. So are you finding that it's, it's difficult, especially with your internal BDR that you're looking to, to, to move to the next level? Did you find that they had that same challenge of they're trying to get the uh, close for the meeting or close for the business that it was too me focused as opposed to the other focused? Um, the challenge of the, well, I, I think this is, you know, this whole separation of like SDRs, BDRs, account executives. Uh, I mean, there's, a, I think, a whole show baked into that whole thing, too. And <laughs> I was kind of late to that game. Um, you know, back when I, I felt like I couldn't be a sales guy, you know, what I would do is I'd look for that one person that I figured that they could just kind of impress me in a job interview and I'd hire them and I expect them to kind of pull out their Rolodex and start landing me business. You know, I, I didn't realize that it wasn't, that it's very much a process and not, not so much just kind of a personality based thing. So when, when I kind of understood kind of how modern sales organizations work and it's kind of subdivided, I could actually go out there and hire a BDR and have look for the personality traits that I know to be successful. Um, you know, uh, my BDR's name is Joe and Joe um, is not an engineer. Um, he really didn't have much of a background even in sales, but what Joe is, is he's, he's, a, he's one of the hardest working guys I've ever met, a superb work ethic. Um, and he just, he very process driven. You know, I, I'm not expecting Joe to have my depth of experience and Joe the ability to actually kind of close deals himself. You know, for him to be very good at his job, he has to be very disciplined, uh, you know, in, in ways that I, my brain's just not wired. So I, I don't know if I'm really addressing your question. Um, you know, I, I don't expect Joe to do my job and I really can't do his job. So that's kind of why we've worked together um, in, well in this model. Yeah. And, and to, to go back to that question is, did you find that, especially when it, whenever he was new, because you likely put out some expectations to him. And this is a real challenge for leadership, I find, is that we have to drive to results, just like you pointed out a little bit earlier, right? No, this is this is a for-profit business. And you don't seem like the type that's going to be too terribly fluffy, right? Because you mm -hmm. seem like you demand a lot of yourself. Therefore, you're going to demand a lot of others. And the results of a BDR is booking meetings, mm -hmm. is having conversations. 
Yep. And so how do you align? We want results, but we don't want you to be salesy. We want results, but you have to be asking questions, having conversations. We want results, but I want you to disqualify this, not just set meetings. So help, because I'm aligned with you there, so don't mishear me. Mm-hmm. Help people to justify that in their mind, because there's a massive tension there that most people screw up. Mm-hmm. When we hired Joe on board, um, you know, one thing he's not on is a commission plan. I, I, I'm not looking to comp him on, on close business. It's just not his job. What, what we do is we, uh, we have what are monthly business objectives or MBOs. Every month I sit with Joe and I figure out what he needs to be working on this week to kind of advance his understanding of the business and to get better at his job. And the fact that we do it monthly kind of gives me flexibility because you know, being a small business, our needs may change monthly. So one month, Joe might be competent uh, on actually completing some uh, online training classes on how to overcome sales objections. Um, you know, maybe there's a stretch goal with, uh, you know, maybe if he can help close $10,000 above deal or something along that lines, there's a pot of money that he can draw from. You know, the next month, it might be, you know, he has to have X number of conversations with with his target account list. And, and then he also has to kind of um, do some additional uh, research on other companies that he's doing. And he has to show me kind of how he's mapped that out. So it, it, I'm not really straightly, he is, his comp is tied to very specific metrics, but it isn't all about the closed business because we have generally a pretty long sales cycle. And, and I kind of need to kind of help shepherd him through that and kind of help him grow uh, his understanding on how to actually be successful in his job. Now, so I really like the, what you're doing there. So it's not, strictly activity-based or behavior-based, you're also putting career advancement. So training, learning, number. Now you do have a specific number of conversations, but one thing that you didn't say is booked meetings. Mm -hmm. So help me understand why not booked meetings? Why not that direct? Because that's kind of what he's supposed to be doing. And any reason that you didn't tie that into comp? Um, so uh, we actually have, in his MBOs, he has three tiers, um, like a tier one, tier two, and then like a tier three stretch. Like okay. the, the tier one stuff is stuff I expect him to get done. It's kind of a layup. You know, the tier two stuff is like things where if he's kind of pushing themselves and he feels motivated and, and he's hungry, like they're within reach. And like the tier three stretch stuff is like, it's kind of a Hail Mary stuff. I mean, it's <laughs> some stuff in which he doesn't have direct control over. Um, all those three objectives, the number of appointments and the number of conversations are always one in, in there somewhere. It's, it's generally a tier one or a tier two, depending on what it is. Tier three is almost always associated with actually closing business or being instrumental in helping close business. So for sure, the number of conversations that he's having is always in there at some point. It's just depending on what our pipeline looks like, I might prioritize it a bit differently for the month. Got it. Okay, so would you... Maybe another way of saying this was your tiers is almost like a leading lagging indicator. So your tier ones are the yep. leading indicators and then tier two. Um, how would you just, uh, how would you say tier two is tier two kind of a uh, lagging indicator of tier one, but a leading indicator of tier three and then tier three or more lagging indicator results-based? I think I understood that. And I think I agree with that. <laughs> uh, it sounds right. That's <laughs> right. We'll go with that one. Right. So, okay. Got it. Now, um, so you're doing monthly BP, uh, monthly business objectives. Now let's talk to that founder who is doing this on his own. I mean, how did you begin, begin this? Because as you started out the company, you were trying to find every which way to get out of sales, but you, you ended up having to do it. Did, did you start to do business development from day one? Talk to me a little bit about how that initial, hey, I'm hanging out my shingle. I need to do sales. I'm still engineer through and through. How did you start that transition? Yeah. Um, it actually had, it came from one of my closest friends at the time. He, he almost had a, a sales in, intervention with me. I mean, he literally <laughs> sat me down, says, you know, Jamie, you are CEO, founder of this company. You have to do sales. There's just no way around it. You have to do sales. And, you know, I mulled that around for a long time and I realized like, yeah, he's right. I mean, even if I hire sales guys or if I have like a sales partner in the business, you know, sales is really just about communicating value and and understanding the customer. Even if I'm sitting in a a dark room writing code, building product, I still better have to uh, better understand how my solution actually, whatever I'm writing or producing solves my customer's goals. 
that's essentially what sales was. So yeah, um, I, I've done uh, kind of cold calling and cold outreach um, in the past. Um, I've never been particularly good at it. Um, partially, again, I think it goes back to just kind of that, that introversion and that inability to, to really put myself out there day in and day out. I can do it for a short period of time. You know, Joe's got such thick skin, he, he can keep rolling through that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and what I do these days though, is I do a lot of cold outreach via uh, LinkedIn. Um, I find that a little bit more my speed. Um, you know, in the before days, um, a lot of my business development was actually done in, in events. You know, I would, I would go to conferences. Sometimes I'd, I'd speak at conferences. Um, you know, I'm really good kind of with small, small groups. Like I, I can, I, that's just kind of my style. I don't mind public speaking, but you know, you put me in a conference room with like 20 people and I got to somehow sell them or something like that. That's just, that's just not me. Um, part of it is because I, I depend so much upon like listening to a customer and what their problems are. And I, I, I can't really do that at scale simultaneously. So, you know, my personal business development efforts is still kind of through my network and, um, and kind of some cold stuff via LinkedIn. And when, when I reach out to people on LinkedIn though, it's not like, Hey, I got something to sell you. I'll reach out to people that I have no idea if I can help them, but, but there's something about them seems interesting, you know? Um, and I just looked at kind of have conversations with people and if they go somewhere, that's fine. If not, you know, I'm not worried about it. You know, I've got relationships. I've been in business with RightBrain for about almost 12 years now. You know, I've had relationships that I've established seven, eight years ago. And, you know, now they, they may produce, you know, somebody might actually refer somebody in or somebody might actually have a new need if they, they change a job. So, you know, Joe's job is to be very transactional. You know, that's how I manage him, you know, month to month. But in my role, like, I can't be transactional and I really have no interest in it. It's really about building these relationships and, and providing real value to people that has been made me successful. Now, how are you teaching Joe? And I'll come back to that transition from uh, engineer into sales in a second, but how have you been training Joe that has to do the more transactional to begin at least to start that relationship building? Because if it takes that long of a sales cycle for you, then it's not transactional. It is gonna be a, a relationship built on trust. So how are you, instilling in Joe who didn't have a lot of sales experience, how are you instilling him how to start to build that relationship of trust from the get-go, even on cold outreach? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there, there's really two components to it. One, um, I finally have armed Joe with a legit sales deck. And okay. I, I know this seems like, like 101 type stuff, but you know, before like he would kind of call into people and kind of feel around trying to gauge their interest, you know, but he, I mean, he was having a kind of you know, go off-roading all the time. And he didn't really have enough understandings of what we, what we sell to be able to do that. So I, even though we have our consulting services, I, and somewhat productized them a little bit in the initial presentation. So Joe actually has some talking points and Joe and I still meet every morning uh, for half an hour to practice that deck every single morning. I have him kind of read it to me. And now then how, kind of, how long has Joe been with you? Uh, about two years now. So two years, every single day, you're pouring your life into that guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, he hasn't always directly reported to me that changed at the beginning of this year. Um, okay. But yeah, we, we meet every day. And, and, and for the past two months, I've had him focus on, on doing the sales deck with me every morning. Um, the, the other part of the question is too, is I realized actually not that long ago that I was trying to program Joe to be too much like myself, my, my, how I speak, how, how, how I handle objections. And what I really realized is like Joe's not me. Um, you know, Joe's actually a professional wrestler, believe, believe it or not. The dude's super fun to talk to, very outgoing, very charismatic. Um, in some ways, almost the opposite of I mean, am I as I am. I mean, he's just a true extrovert. So I really had to encourage Joe to be himself, you know, much back like my, my dating thing. Like he can't channel Jamie when he gets on the call. I can give him some ideas and some talking points, but he's really got to kind of find his own his own stride and, and his own personality and, and kind of lead with that because he can't genuinely connect with people unless he's being himself. Agreed with that. So let's go back to what you had started off with is what makes you a really good salesperson is being able to uncover problems. And mm -hmm. if I'm extremely extra extroverted, I tend to talk too much and, you know, I'm storytelling. So have you been helping, um, helping Joe at all to maybe ask some better questions? Has that been your secret sauce or where, where's mm -hmm. your biggest area of focus for him to allow him to have his own voice yet follow this, you know, what you know to be, to work. 
Yeah, you, you nailed it. It's harmony him with questions. Um, I'll way more often sell a deal based upon the quality of my questions that I'm asking than what would I say in my statements. You know, if I'm asking the right questions, the customer knows that I get them and get their problem. And that's what I'm trying to arm Joe with, the ability to ask the right questions in the right way. Um, and then he's just got to kind of make, make uh, it his own, how he evolves it from there. Yeah, because my sense is if I were to put you on the spot, hey, Jamie, what problems do you solve? You probably instantly go, well, I got these three, four, five things. We solve these. If it's not one of these, we can kind of stretch, but really our sweet spot are these three, four, five things. Is that a mm -hmm. fair assumption? Yep, exactly. And it's knowing what those are and having the confidence to say no to the things outside of that is, is key as well. Yeah, and, you, and I liked how you said off-roading, right? So because if you start to get off of those three to five, what we're really good at, that's where we go in your terminology. I might have to steal. A, a, so here's the way it would work, Jamie. The first time I'll say, hey, I was talking to Jamie. He, he told me about off-roading. I'll give you credit the first time. The second one, some guy I know. The next time it's going to be mine. Just so. <laughs> All right, right. Well, I, I ex expect my, my check here. You got it. All right. Sense, we'll man. get the royalty coming over. Right. Um, so you get those three, four, five things, but then it's it's being able to connect the dots to those three, four, five things through through the questioning strategy. So with you putting that playbook together, he's going to allow that my sense is, and you can tell me if this, you've seen this over these last two months, he's able to get further and further off of those talking points because he's able to better connect the dots. And if somebody's way out, out in left field, he can connect the dots for them to see if that person is going to come into where, where your sweet spot is. And if not, to your point, you disqualify them. And have you started to see that come about? Yeah. And, and that's what I'm currently working on with Joe. Um, you know, up until rather recently, like I didn't put any of the, the qualifying or disqualifying stuff on him. His job was to get meetings, I, you, know, you know, crappy ones, good ones, you know, tall ones, skinny ones. It, whatever meaning he got, I would invest my time and actually get on the call in qualifying people. And I, as I would do that with, with Joe on the phone, you know, we would debrief afterwards and I'd be like, you know, this is why the person was or was not qualified. This is where I think that they're qualifying, but th these are like some yellow flags that we would need to dig deeper in. So I did teach him kind of how to kind of qualify those and armed with those, he is able to kind of kind of explore a little bit with, with customers and, and kind of think on his feet and ask the right questions as well. Nice. Now, do you have him where he's he's doing the uh, the exploratory calls for you yet or not quite yet? Yeah. And I'm also have him uh, working with some of our smaller existing accounts with the relationships that I already feel solid in and kind of getting in there and kind of understanding what problems we actually solve once we win the business. And and then, then he can kind of correlate that in his brain when he's talking to, to, to new prospects as well. So it, it's kind of a work in progress. Um, yeah, I've never been a sales manager before. You know, it, it's part of what I, what I got to do now. And, and you know, I'm kind of always learning. Yeah, well, and that's the thing, right? Because as soon as you figure it out, something else is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, so with, oh, shoot, I had a question for you and it's escaping me. So let me go back to it. Um, oh, with the exploratory calls, you have them on those exploratory calls and you're spending quite a lot of time with them. You talked about daily gets to getting together to go over that sales deck. You've also talked about post-call debriefs or post-meeting debriefs. This is a lot of time that you're pouring in, into, into Joe. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that, that, I don't care what position they are, hey, listen, they should know how to do this stuff already. They're in sales, for goodness sakes. Just go out and sell. You do it. That's what I'm paying you for. What would you say to that person? Because you're doing the exact opposite. Yeah, I mean, the best way to learn something is to teach it. You know, so I'm, I'm learning as I'm teaching him and I'm investing in myself just as much as I'm investing in Joe. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I, I manage a, a lot of engineers as well and they're not a whole lot different. Like, like I need to invest in these people. I, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't like to treat people, customers, employees, anybody as like they're just disposable resources that, you know, I just kind of plug them in and then drain the juice and, and then they, you know, hire somebody else once they, they flame out. You know, I work for enough of those people. And, you know, one of the reasons I started to write brain is to build the place I wanted to work. And a big part of that is actually investing in our people. So it, it's not something like I woke up one morning and realized, oh, hey, I got to invest in Joe. That's it, just kind of part of our ethos there. And 
I, I don't know. I, I've I've got people who have been with me for you know eight nine years, and and like these are just people that feel valued, and they're going to want to stick around. And I think if I'm doing a good enough job supporting them, that they're going to want to be rock stars in their jobs. And and I'm just and I'm there to encourage that and and offering them any any help that I can I can get them to, to get there. Now how's Okay, so let's go down to the salesperson. Okay, uh, listen, just leave me alone. I want to do my thing. I don't need you to, to to spend all this time time with me. Just leave me alone. What would you say to that salesperson? Um, that was probably an indication of a bad hire, because like one of the things that I need for my sales folks, and Joe's not the only, first and only sales guy I've ever hired, is, is they need to be teachable, uh, because they don't know everything coming in here and and. I certainly don't know anything. And like, if they're just not teachable from the beginning and I've had these guys, um, they're, they're, I, it's a bad hire. I, they're, there's no way that I can create curiosity in somebody who, who doesn't already have that. Yeah. So, and that goes back to, and, and you can listen to time and time and time again through the, through the, the podcast that we've done over the last, you know, close to 60, 70 of these that we're up to right now. It goes into the same traits and characteristics. There's nothing new under the sun, but it's going to be on you as the sales leader. How are you going to test for curiosity? How are you going to test for, can this person do questioning strategy? Because if they're the stereotypical ex extrovert, so I have a guy on my team that's doing really, really well, but because he's an extrovert, he's driving right over things and missing things. But because he's coachable, he wants to learn He's absolutely coming around and doing just a bang up job. So these these folks can be taught. And, and to your last point, Jamie, is if they don't want that culture, if they don't want to have a learning culture, then that's going to be a mishire. So I'd really encourage you as well, whenever you're looking to hire these people, that you make sure, please, that you're asking them simple questions. So can I put you on the spot and ask, you know, how are you, how are you finding are they curious or are they lifelong learners or we, we call it growth mindset, you know, Carol Dweck stuff. How are you mm -hmm. testing for that growth mindset, coachable, trainable, uh, lifetime learners? I mean, a big part of that is in the job interview. Uh, they better be asking me good questions and, you know, ways about how they can succeed at right brain and, and what type of, uh, you know, growth opportunities that there are here and kind of, you know, asking questions about our sales process and, and how our solutions actually solve problems for the customers. You know, if all they're asking about is like, you know, when do I get paid? And, and, <laughs> or worse, they don't ask any questions whatsoever. Like, I think that's just a, a red flag right there. Um, that isn't going to catch everybody. Some people are just really good interviewers, but um, that's a pretty reliable indicator in my, in my experience. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one, asking questions and, and then two, um, you know, I, I found that ask them, what, what's the latest podcast that you listen to? What's the latest mm -hmm. book that you've read? What have you done other than you being forced to go to training by your company? What training have you done? And if they, mm -hmm. they read a book back whenever they were in high school, um, assuming they've graduated a couple of years ago, if they, um, you know, if they didn't read a book since high school or they haven't done any training except for what was paid for, they're not doing any type of learning, listening, that's likely not going to fit within your culture. So really figure out what you want whenever you're looking for these folks and make sure to ask, because let's face it, if I'm a good people person, I'm going to interview well. And I'm going to be able to fake it because what you've already talked about too, Jamie, is you seem like you're going to be really good at asking questions and peeling that, peeling back that onion to make sure that they can justify their initial answer. Mm -hmm. And I'd also say, make sure that, uh, that they're a process oriented salesperson as well, that they're not purely a relationship salesperson. Uh, I, I think, I think there's some elements of that, especially in our, in our business, which is really high touch, but like, uh, you know, the days of like being really successful using your Rolodex are, are gone because the customers are just so better informed and have so much more information available to you. So like, you know, the person has to understand the formula in which to sell and kind of how to engage. And in some ways, I think some of the best hires I've made in sales have actually been athletes, either current or former, because, because they understand that it's a, it's a, a process. It can be a grind and, and they're okay with that. They're understanding that, that it, it takes time to produce results. You know, I mentioned Joe is a professional wrestler. The guy still goes to the gym every day at 5 a.m. and works out. And, 
you know, I, I, my most successful sales guy besides Joe prior to this was a ba college basketball coach. You know, these are people who are just kind of wired to kind of think in kind of a longer term thing. That, that's another thing that I look for when, when I interview. You know, this, you bring up a really good point on that, Jamie, and no one's really brought that up. It, usually salespeople are very tactical. And if I'm very tactical, I'm not usually a good problem solver, right? I'm just looking to put out the fire, get it done, which also means that I'm not terribly um, great at process. So the two examples that you gave with Joe being a professional wrestler, waking up every morning at 5 a.m., he knows self-discipline. Mm -hmm. Your coach knows how to teach. So if I have a complex problem, to be able to teach, I need to be a lifelong, long, lifelong learner so I can teach. And if I have that professional self, or if I have that self-discipline, then I know the grind and I can get to it. And so it's really that combination of finding that. So you've really laid it, laid it out there. That's the secret sauce. If I can find a lifelong long learner, a lifetime learner who has the self-discipline to drive and grit and get through it and being able to teach. So, you know, taking out of a challenger methodology, that challenger idea mm -hmm. of teach, tailor, take control kind of thing. But that comes from, listening, knowing the problem, and then being able to ask the right questions to find out, is there truly a problem? And then if they're not, I'm going away. And now I have the best evangelist in the world that's going to make all types of introductions for me. And that, and that's really no secret sauce, but they're not very easy to find often. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I think pretty much, I'm trying to recall, like of all the sellers I've ever hired, like anybody that ever came in with, with like a resume in hand, didn't do well. Um, you know, Joe came in for, as a friend of a friend, you know, basketball coach I mentioned to you earlier was, was a friend of mine growing up. And yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the best people probably aren't on the market. And that's been one of the, my challenges as well. But, you know, my network, I can hire good engineers all day because that's just a circle that, that I roll in. Um, it's, it's a lot harder for me to actually find um, good sellers. You know, it's just not the, the, the career that I've built. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping that maybe some of your listeners might, might have a, a better uh, source of, of, of talent than myself. Well, and it's, it's kind of curious because even the, everybody hires a little bit differently. And the challenge is, you know, whenever you see a salesperson, they have moved from one job to the other job and the other job. And they've had they've been in sales for 20 years, but they've they've done it one year at a time. Right. They have one year of experience over and over and over again. So they're not really 20 years into it, but they're still not any good. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll find a lot of that out there. So that, that's one of the reasons that we started our company is to be able to vet those salespeople who can are notoriously good interviewers. So it is it is a, a challenge, a real challenge out there uh, to do that. So wholeheartedly agree off of that. Well, okay. I, I mean, so you're you're speaking to help him grow him, pouring into him, doing um, posts called debriefs. Any other major ahas that you learned in doing this? Because it seems like everything that you've learned, you're passing along to Joe. Any, what final thoughts do you have about how you made this massive transition from this engineer into sales, you know, you know, thinking to that founder, CEO, very technical person that doesn't have time to do this, still doesn't have a want to do this. What final thoughts do you have for him? Um, I mean, the same thing that was told me, you have to do it. I, I, I don't know how any other way to put it. Like you just can't be successful unless you understand your customer, understand their problems and understand how your solution actually addresses those problems. And, and understanding it isn't good enough. You got to, you have to know how to communicate that. And that's really all sales is, is just taking that and mapping that to a process or a repeatable process. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, sales, sales is a numbers game. You know, I'm, my job isn't out there to convert, people convince them my job is actually to find the people who are open to kind of change and that is purely a numbers game it's just hitting people at the right time so it, as long as you kind of have that understanding that kind of goes you know soup to nuts from the beginning and you know how to uh, map that to a, a process i don't know how how to be successful otherwise i mean i it, it, there's really no magic to it you know it's not a personality thing it's it's, it's just kind of repetition and, and, and knowledge and experience all right, so let's let's play the other side. Well, no, I disagree with you. That's why I have. I'll just hire a salesperson. I'll hire hire marketing. Marketing will tell me, 
tell the salesperson what to say, but I have to code. I have to build this thing. I have to run the company. What would you say to that person? Um, I think it could be a division of labor. I think if you're partnered with somebody um, and they're going to run that sales machine, that's fine. But you still have, you know, I'm not a big quote guy, but one of my favorites is never delegate understanding. Hmm. And that's a Charles Eames one. Like you got to understand this stuff. You don't necessarily have to do it, but if you, if you don't have the understanding, then you're not going to be able to manage, measure. You know, it's just, I, I don't know how you could do it. That one hurt there, Jamie. I hate that quote. What was that again? You can't never, delegate understanding? It never delegate understanding. Yeah. And who was that by? Uh, Charles Eames. Charles Eames. Awesome. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, that was one of my biggest mistakes, Jamie, is I, call it, uh, I called it uh, abdicating, not delegating, right? Mm -hmm. I was exactly. delegating under because I had no idea how to do it. That's brilliant right there. So even if they did have startup capital, even if they were able to do that, you would still suggest to them to be able to truly understand this. They should get in, should jump into this, have some type of interaction in sales process, in sales meetings to hear what's going on, customer feedback, what they're really looking for and being able to, you know, lay out the vision of, this, of, the, of what they're doing better than anyone. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, forget about revenue generation, sales numbers, any of that type of stuff. I mean, set that aside. Your salespeople are the ones closest to the customer. They're hearing the customer's problems. They're understanding how your solutions solve those problems. You know, apart from the whole money thing, like that is a crucial component of any, any company. Like if you don't understand your customer and how your, your solutions actually solve their problems, then, then what are you doing? So yeah, you don't necessarily have to be the guy out there with the quota carrying closing deals, but you got to understand what sales means for your organization. Yeah. And, and the thing is too, you, tell me if this is true. Um, what you've learned in sales, has that helped you to drive vision, to drive culture uh, in your organization? Definitely. Because yeah, I can't hide in the back room here coming up with grand plans and then hoping my customers buy into that. I mean, I, I think that's a very easy uh, kind of pattern for engineers to kind of fall into is it, just kind of stay in their own head. I've got to be out there talking to customers and I've got to be validating what my thoughts are, are actually solving their problems and of understanding them. I, I, I'd be terrible at my job if I couldn't do that. Yeah. Well, and I, I remember that you, you uh, were talking earlier. I remembered what you were working on. You were, you were thinking about, you know, putting together a white paper or something along the lines of, some of the lessons learned from from sales so when when's that coming out because you've had some really good stuff here um uh, i'm not sure to be honest <laughs> with you you know what i'm really focused on right now is helping um organizations uh, become SaaS companies uh, you know a large part of our customers are, are kind of established software development firms or enterprises that do software development and, and they're trying to get into the SaaS game um and it's it's difficult to do if you kind of have an established process and established team and everything like that. And that's kind of where, where we can actually help out with that. And, and conversely, we also work with kind of um, uh, startups as well and kind of help them uh, scale by adding some, a lot of process around how they actually do product development and, and software development. And, and so we're, we're working with you know, startups to become more like enterprises and enterprises to become more like startups. So that's nice. What I'm focused on right now. Um, I don't know. I, all my sales knowledge is stuff I've learned through brute force and ignorance and, and plenty of punches in the face. And, you know, I, I don't know what that's worth 25 cents. You know, I'm, I'm hoping maybe somebody you know, finds some value in here. You know, maybe someday I'll get around to writing a book on it. If, if, it, if it's something that's of value. Well, we'll use this podcast as your, uh, as your baseline for you. So let, let's, <laughs> let's go off of that. Now, lesson learned, like you were engineer, you, 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 got punched in the face, like you said, all of this, all of the challenges that you had to go through. What's one of the biggest lessons learned, biggest mistakes, most painful lessons maybe you had that you can share with others so they can avoid that? Sure. Uh, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, you don't have to be smarter than anybody else. You just got to outlast everybody else. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there, there have been so many times that I've wanted to give up, so many times that I've almost been like forced to give up. And I just hang on there. I mean, and it's just, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I've had many bosses through, throughout the years and I was like wondering like, man, I could be doing such a much better job of running this company than this guy. Why do I got to work for somebody who, who's not, who just doesn't have it all, all together. And I, I realized it's not really about smarts or anything like that. It's just your ability just to kind of persevere and, and hang, hang on it and just, just grind it out. Um, it's ability to kind of just, just do that. I, I mean, 
you know, I used to be a competitive power lifter. So I'm like, I'm accustomed to like being in the gym and just grinding the stuff out and wanting to give up, but pushing myself to, 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 you know, make that other, other lift, you know, kind of get another rep in. And that's the exact same thing. I mean, as long as you can hang in there, like I'll, I'll your lessons are going to come to you through, just through, through, uh, through personal experience. Just don't give up. I mean, it sounds simplistic, but it, but it's really hard. I love that. Now I'm going to step back. Um, I missed this in the note. You said, I didn't really understand what sales was or what sales really is mm -hmm. real quick. What is sales? What is it really now that you you're in it? What would you have said back to your engineer self back in the day? What is sales? It's matchmaking. You know, it's understanding what the customer's problem is, understanding my solution and seeing if there's a fit. You know, it, it's not about convincing somebody that, you know, I'm the best or that they, they need to see the world as I see the world. You know, it's understanding their view and seeing if there, there's a good fit. And at the end of the day, that's just what it is. It's matchmaking. But I mean, that's a very simplistic way to say that. I mean, you, you obviously there's, there's a lot of uh, like process that goes beyond that to make sure you're finding the right people and talking to them and qualifying them. Um, and, but yeah, matchmaking. Yeah, it's, it's really good. And then how about a business hack? I mean, any, any suggestions that you'd have for us, whether it's talent, how to find really good talent or any, any nuances, a hack for sales or how to scale up a business? What's one good takeaway for us from a, something that you learned? A uh, hack. Um, I don't know if you... All right. Uh, here's one that's kind of worked for us a little bit. I actually kind of just kind of came up with one myself is when we're, we're talking to a customer that we may have had peripherally you know, connected with in the past, what I'll do is I'll go on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll look for um, somebody that we may have been sp speaking to in the past or may have tangentially have been speaking to and who's, who's left the company within the past, say uh, six to 12 months. And, and then I'll find somebody that took over his position and then I'll actually send them uh, an email or, or, or LinkedIn in mail message with, the name of the person that they replaced. And that's almost like guaranteed open. And <laughs> what I'll say is like, Hey, um, I was having a conversation with Joe Blow uh, about you know, X, Y, and Z a few months ago. Um, I know he's no longer with the company. Um, are you the right person to continue to have a conversation with? So I don't know if you're looking for a tip and trick, uh, you know, that, that has a high open rate when I just have an email with just a subject line of the person that they left. Um, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot whether they'll actually kind of take the call, but uh, it's an in. I love that. That's brilliant. Because all you're looking for is a conversation starter. How do you stand out in the sea of, you know, as Josh Braun says, how do you stand out in the, as a red X in the sea of uh, white circles? So yeah, mm -hmm. that's, I, I've not heard that one. Well done, Jamie. That's mm -hmm. great. I'm going to have to take, uh, utilize that one ourselves. All right. Um, resources that you might recommend. So you have your podcast, definitely drop that one, but uh, books, podcasts, guides that you might recommend. Um, I think a really great book around this stuff for like, if you're a startup looking to kind of get smart on, on how, to, how to scale a sales organization, there's uh, called the, the sales acceleration formula, uh, by, uh, a Mark something or other. And I, I can't, his last name escapes me, but he was one of the first hires at HubSpot. Um, and he was actually hired into the, into the job to grow a sales organization with zero sales experience. He was actually an engineer. And so he has this engineer approach on actually how, how to build a scalable sales, uh, 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 organization at a SaaS company. It, it's a really good book. Um, that, that's and you mentioned earlier the, the challenger sale. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of that, especially if you're kind of doing any type of consulting. I, I think in, in this day and age, that's uh, the best approach that that I've found thus far. Um, but I also I'd like to encourage anybody who who's an entrepreneur or just getting started uh, not to overindulge on the books. You know, maybe don't read any <laughs> books because I, I I mean a lot like this is when I was when I was a parent when when I when, you know my a lot of new parents, like read everything they possibly can. And I made it, when, you know, when my wife got pregnant, I like read one book and, and that's it because, because I knew that I could just intuitively figure out everything along the way. I just didn't need to be overly dependent upon like other piece of other people's opinion. And the same holds true for entrepreneurs, like books to some extent can be a bit of a crutch. Like you, you think you got to get everything perfect before you're willing to take that first step. And it's just, I got to read one more book or I got to listen to one more podcast just to make sure that I don't make any mistakes. Get out there and make mistakes. Make them as fast as you can. Make as many as you can. Learn from them along the way. And then kind of augment with, with additional sources of information along the way. But don't use this as a crutch for inaction. Get out there and start making mistakes. 
Yeah. So fail early, fail or fail fast, fail, fail often kind of thing and, and mm -hmm. take action. If you're going to read a book, don't read it for knowledge sake, but read it for application sake. I yeah, think that's exactly. great, great advice. Thank you. And then what are you watching for? I mean, what's the future hold? What are you kind of watching and going, oh, I got to kind of watch for this coming down the pike. What, what, what are you uh, paying attention to? Um, as far as like sales goes, I'm, I'm really looking like the sales automation tools that are coming out. Uh, you know, a large part of our business is actually doing like AI based and machine learning solutions for our customers. So I'm very familiar with this space. Um, and there's just some really interesting products and services that are coming around here that kind of blend like a lot of this AI and machine learning and, and kind of apply it to outbound prospecting. Uh, it'll be curious to see whether they, that they can effectively replace BDRs and, or just, you know, straight up prospecting for a, a salesperson's uh, you know part of their day i stuff i've seen thus far um i think it's got a long long way to go i think it's almost like spamming people 2.0 <laughs> I, I, there needs to be some additional value and some thought put into that but that, that's what i'm curious to see how things evolve in the next few years nice okay yeah we're, that's um getting more and more the the, the most popular answer we, we're getting here jamie mm -hmm. it's going to be curious because can a machine ever adapt and communicate like a human can? Because can AI ever get to that problem solving, that solutioning, like you suggested? It's curious. We'll we'll see mm -hmm. what that holds. I I don't know. I don't know yet. Yeah, I I, I think it's going to replace BDRs sooner rather than later because because their 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 job is to just you know gather interest and and, and get appointments. I think that'd be. A, you know, easier to automate than, than certainly kind of the, the solution selling or, you know, the relationship management. I mean, uh, I honestly hope that nobody tries to kind of automate away relationships anytime soon, but, you know, who knows? Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you what, I really appreciate this, Jamie. Really, really good insights. Well done. I appreciate it. So who should reach out to you? How should they do it? And why should people reach out to you here, Jamie? Um, I mean, I, uh, if you're looking to kind of launch a, sale, a SaaS product, or you need help on kind of cloud architecture and how to scale a SaaS business, um, you know, I'm happy to help. You know, again, exactly what I've been talking about for, you know, the past you know, hour or whatever it is. I like to have conversations with people and, and see if there's an opportunity to help them. And, and if not, you know, it, it, I'll talk to almost anybody. And, and you know, it's another great connection I have. Got it. And, and how should they reach out to you here? Um, probably the best way uh, would be either to, to send me an email at jjbegin at rightbrainnetworks.com, or you can search for me on LinkedIn. It's Jamie, J-A-M-I-E, and the last name is Began, B-E-G-I-N. Um, I'm one of two Jamies in the world. The other one is a woman. She's a real estate agent, so I'm the other one. <laughs> that makes it nice and easy. Got yeah. it. Hey, I can't thank you enough, Jamie. Well done. Uh, it was good talking to you, and please, please, please take what Jamie's talking about what he didn't say, but I really appreciate is pour your life into others. Your, mm -hmm. his leadership style from what I'm gathering here, and you can correct me here, is a service to others. He doesn't have a direct report, but a direct support that he's supporting. And if we do that, it gets contagious within the organization. And that's how we can have people stick around for eight, nine, 10 years. So that's, that's really good stuff. So take this, apply it, get after it. Affect community pause or affect po, or the community in a positive way through awesome entrepreneurship. Jamie mm -hmm. can help you out, and and I would love to help you out too. So let's get after it, everyone. Sell some stuff, would you? See you. Thank you.